Hello, and welcome to the Passion on Purpose Leaders on Center Stage podcast. I am Steph, and I'm the owner and creative director of Vim. Vim's mission is to showcase the enthusiasm and passion of business leaders nationwide. I cannot wait to have you listen to the show and stick around. At the end, we talk a little bit about how you can be my next guest. All right, we are back with another episode of the Passion on Purpose Leaders on Center Stage podcast. I just realized that I failed to let to ask you an important question, Mike. How do you pronounce your last name? So think of Amish and put a D in front of it, Damish. Dom. Okay, so I'm so glad I asked. So Mike <laughs> Damish, because I would have butchered that completely. I apologize, but we are here with Mike Damish, and we have um, we're going to be talking all things the Center for Respect, which I'm so excited to learn more about. Um, and I, I just want to once again thank you for being here, Mike. Well, thanks for having me, Steph. I'm excited for the conversation. Yes, likewise. So as I prepared you slightly before we went on air, we are going to start with our hard-hitting question. Are you ready? I'm ready. I feel like you are. Okay. What is your why? Well, my why is very personal. I got involved in the work of respect because my sister was raped in 1989. Uh So what happened was I was an angry brother. And I didn't know a way to vent this or do anything with it. And then I realized, wait, I can do something about this through my voice. That was in 1990, 91, I started speaking out. And here we are, hard to believe in 2023, this many years later, uh, doing the work. Holy smokes. What a talk about hitting us with the meat and potatoes right early on in the episode. So that clearly has really impacted your life, your relationship with your sister. Is your sister younger, older? Uh, all my sisters are older. I'm the youngest of three older sisters. Sherry, the survivor, is four years older than me. Okay. And this was in 1989. Wow. What a crazy impact. And so at that time, how old were you? I was 19. She was 23. So I was in college when it happened. And you had the, the, the like, tell me, I want to know about this journey. Because for you to have at 19, the wherewithal to be like, I can do something about this. Or what can I do about this, right? To even have the, like, what can I do about this besides, you know, probably like you said, the angry, the angry emotions, the like beat them down or whatever the situation was, you had some wherewithal at a certain point to say, I have a voice, I can speak on this. So what was the journey like from 19 to, to like, whether it's the center for respect or was there something before that? Take me along. It was, it was a different name. It was a date safe project before that. And it was consulting the date safe project. And date before safe. that, it was Damish Consulting, which no one can spell. <laughs> so that, that, that's not good either. Good uh, call. The, yeah, exactly. So uh, it started, it did start from anger, without a doubt. When I was, and so what happened was I was in college and lost and confused. That's what really happened. And I was an athlete and we were required to go hear a speaker. And this was in 1990. So not even a year later after the assault. And I heard the speaker and I thought, wait, I could do that. I could speak about this. And that's where everything changed. That's where the light bulb went off. And I went to that speaker and said, I want to do this. Now, keep in mind, in 1990, people were not talking about this conversation. And that was the first time I'd ever heard any discussion around this topic at that point in college. And most colleges weren't doing what that college was doing. So it was really, really rare. And he said, well, if you show up at my place, I'll give you the information to do your own thing. And that's exactly what I did. I showed up and he held up and to his bar end of the bargain too, and just gave me everything he had. And I went back and started writing a speech and started going to local schools and it just grew and grew and grew. And don't get me wrong. It, you know, everybody thinks success goes like this, but right. it, it went like this because I didn't leave it for a while because nobody was willing to have the conversation. Schools weren't willing to have it. And I looked way too young at the time. When I was 22, I looked 16 and I wish I was exaggerating. Unfortunately, I was not. That was not something that was an asset with yeah. this kind of a topic. Yeah, you had a lot of things stacked against you. Yeah, I mean, I'm being completely genuine. The time, yeah. the openness to speak on this, the, you know, whether while we all want to not judge others based on appearance, we naturally our brain does that, right? Mm-hmm. I'm in the world of branding, and that's that's the bread and butter of what we do is we do it with our vision and what we see. And yeah. so, yeah, you had a lot stacked against you, but you had this really deep personal tie and mission to it. And so I want to know where, 
the word respect, right? Because there's a lot of words that we can use that you could have pulled out, but clearly you you really are honing in on this level of respect. So tell me more about that. Yeah, that was more recent, ironically, in this long journey, that was a transition of the last six years. Okay. So prior to that, I was really focused. It was, we were the date safe project. It was, we were focused on the word sexual assault. My first, one of my first pamphlets when I was 21 years old in college was sexual assault and you, S-A-Y, say, like consent talk. But it was a horrible, horrible connection because nobody wanted to think that way. Uh, and so what happened was when I was doing the date site project, I realized, wait, this name's not good because I'm doing work with corporations and helping them change their culture. Well, they're not dating and they're not thinking about dates, you know, safe dating. And I'm like, what, what burns me? What really fires me up? At the heart of all my work, I realized was respect, even though yeah. it wasn't the title of my organization. It was the heart of everything I was doing. And so I was sitting in an event in 2018 and went, wait a second, I, I need to change the name. We need to be the center for respect. Now, I thought, Steph, at that point, no way. Somebody's got that by now. Some university has that by now. Somewhere in the world is a center for respect. Yeah. There was zero. So within minutes, I owned every domain I owned. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, I went, I went all in. And we made that shift quickly uh, over that year. And that's when we became the Center for Respect. It's really changed the game for us because I do a lot of work with companies that is not related to sexual violence, that takes the model we created around sexual violence and puts it in all relationships, how to build healthy relationships across the board. And that has opened the door for companies to see, wow, that we can really benefit from this this could change the way we operate in the workplace. Yeah. So I want to step back a bit because we jumped forward a ton, but yeah. you have such depth to your mission and that why, and you started off being very transparent about that anger. And I think especially as somebody close to somebody who was sexually assaulted or had any sort of, you know, violence or anything it's just even ne a negative. I have, I was literally just telling my mom the other day about this silly instance of my brother, you know, getting bullied a slight little bit in our neighborhood. And I remember still, still this day, the, like the anger I can, I can feel it. Right. Yeah. Like, gosh, I bumped, my, bumped and got bruises and scraped my knees so much. I can't feel any of that, but I can feel the anger from that protection of my brother. And so I want to know, how you what was the long what was the length of time it took to take anger and turn it into fuel and what did that journey look like for you well when i first started speaking it was from anger and so i'd get in front of room i'm like are you aware of this are you aware of that and people would be like well that's powerful but it also sounds like you hate men I'm like mm. what i'm like what are you talking about i i'm a guy why would i hate myself like what's right. the uh and so then I, I did a little interaction with this group and the professor was a friend of mine and said, Mike, when you did those role plays and you were doing like this how-to stuff, the room lit up, it lit up. That would change, that moment changed my life, mm -hmm. his comment. Cause then I realized, wait a second, what if we switch to focusing on what to do? Everybody's talking about what not to do. What if we focused on what to do? And that's when everything switched right there stuff. It was in a classroom at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater he sat down and we started having that conversation. And then I totally went the other extreme. I went to how do we build programs that are all positive how-to? So that if you're doing the right how-to, these things aren't happening. Right, right, right. Oh my goodness. And so like to me, I also love he that he had that like positive spin on listen. When you did this moment, the room lit up. And my first thought was, once again, and I'm not by natural, my, by nature, I'm typically po poly positive, like air towards the positive. But my first thought was no one really wants to be like screamed at and lectured to by an angry person. Right. You know what I mean? That's right. And so for, for him to say, not even mention that, but just say, this is when the room lit up. This is where you were making impact emotionally, mentally, and on the heart. Like that was like, the, what a blessing to have him in, in your life. It was. And we he was a mentor for me through life. He just passed away last summer. Uh, oh. And we stayed close throughout all those years. I will back up a little bit. Like you, you lean positive. I yeah. leaned heavily positive back then. So okay. when I say I came with anger, there were points in the program where when I got serious, that was the energy. But yeah. I am a positive, hi, let's high energy. Even in that discussion, I was that way. So it stood out even more when I was going against myself. You know what yeah. I mean? It, it jumped out even that much more on the page. 
Yeah. And then you realize like the other piece that I feel like, and it sounds like you've worked into your program is we as humans, well, one, we all have different learning styles, but I feel like in, in group settings, when you're trying to convey a message, when you get involvement, right? When people start to do, whether it's talking to the neighbor or, you know, standing up and sitting, just any sort of doing that happens during these presentations and, and learning something new, there's power in that. And so how is that moment then with, with him telling you, listen, this is when the room lights up. What did, how much did that, you said it changed everything, but and what does it look like now? So I am completely known for interaction. That's all I, yeah. I mean, people, when they talk about me, I'm known for what's called call and response. So in a one hour keynote or in a one hour program, I am asking a question to the audience. They all yell it, whether it's a thousand or 10 people in the room, they're yelling the answer at once. Then we mm -hmm. drive the conversation based on what they yell out. And this, what's beautiful about that stuff is the program's never about me because we're just driving based on their answers. I used mm -hmm. to have people say, how are you going to do this work when you look so much older? Oh. And because they thought they have to relate to you. And I'm like, this isn't about me. It never yeah. has been. And so what's ironic is the older I've gotten, the more our demand is, including for younger audiences, because mm -hmm. it's never about me. And when you do, in, when you role play like that, and when you ask questions like that, the audience isn't thinking about you. They're thinking about themselves. So I'll yes. give you a quick example. If I Thank say to you. everyone, yeah, if I say to everyone out there right now, I want you to think of your sex life just quickly. Everybody think of their sex life and think the last time you said no to sex when your partner was really in the mood. What word did you say before you said no? Mm. So what word do you think most people say right before they say no stuff? I think it differs for men to, men to women, but I would say, say sorry. Bingo. Why are we apologizing? Right. Why are we right. apologizing for making a choice that we don't want? Right. So yeah. that tells you how much guilt and shame we've placed into society over the word no. We've made right. it a mean word. So I have to apologize to you for saying it, even though you gave me the choice potentially. You asked. Right. So you gave me the choice. And by the way, I should always be given one, obviously, but you gave me the choice and I still felt guilt or shame over my answer. So mm -hmm. when you do that and people go, yeah, oh my gosh, I've totally done that. Now it's their world. It's yes. not about what Mike's saying. It's going, oh, I've done, why have I done that? And now they explore through their own mirror, through their own world, and they make the changes for themselves, not because someone's telling them to, because they, yeah. they make the changes because they want it for their life. Mm -hmm. And I think to me, what I love about the angle that you take on this is you're immediately getting them not to connect to you, but to themselves. Yes. And the only way you can get them to realize, okay, wait a minute, I'm tuning into this is to get them involved and to ask them questions and get them like I just did to answer yeah, a simple and, question. And the cool thing about it is the key is you do need to know your topic because yeah. the danger there is I had to be pretty confident you were going to say sorry. And you and I did not discuss this. No. Right? So <laughs> the fact that you said the word that I know was said 96% of the time yeah. is because I can safely go there. Now, you could have said other words. We're still going to be able to have a great conversation around that and those right. words. But it, when you know your topic, you can let the audience drive the conversation because you're going to be okay no matter what they bring up. Yeah. Because this is what you do. You're not writing a speech. And that's the big difference of somebody giving a speech versus someone having a conversation with an audience. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that because I was recently reflecting on because, you know, post post hitting record, right? I kind of we teased a tiny little bit about how we start the show and, and the listeners know we always start with my hard hitting question. And that does sometimes catch people off guard. But more times than not, the people who are coming on my show are quick on their feet and they're coming from such right. We, my show is the passion on purpose <laughs> leaders on center stage. Right. So people aren't coming on my show without a deep passion and intentionality behind why they do what they do. And so what I love about you pointing that out is most of the people who come on the show, because they're so in alignment with why they do what they do, they're not afraid of any question I could bring to the table. That's right. And that's what you have with your audience, with what you do. You're like, I don't know if you're going to say that, sorry, but no matter what you say, I know where I can go with it. Exactly. And I want everybody to hear that who's watching or listening right now, because so many people watching and listening will tell me, oh, I want to talk on this, but I'm not a good speaker. Or I want to talk about this, but mm -hmm. I don't know how to write a speech. 
is this your passion, right? Because it's the name of your show. Is it your passion? If it's your passion and you know the topic, I bet if you sat down with a friend and they started asking questions around the topic, you'd be totally comfortable yeah. handling that conversation. And the person's always like, of course I would, of course I would. That's yep. what the audience is. It's the person yeah. seeking, needing your support. They might not even know they need it yet, but they're there. That's what you're in the room for. Just yeah. be there for them. It's not about you being great. Now, the, yeah. the irony is you become great on stage by being there for them. Yes. Well, and also if you're passionate about something and you are posed a question that you don't know the answer to, that passion is going to lead you to be like, you know, no one's ever asked me that. Or I don't actually know, but you just triggered something really exciting for me. And my geek, my geekness is going to like go out off, off air and I'm going to start researching what you asked me or whatever, you know, came up because there's truly that passion there. And so, you know, great speakers, great authentic leaders who have that true passion, there's that so much power in the confidence that that brings. A hundred percent. And, or you just leave it and go, you know, the last thing I'm going to do is give you advice. I don't know. Right. And people so appreciate that because they expect the speaker, the author, the expert to always come up with an answer, uh -huh. even though, so they make it up is what a lot of people do. Cause they think, oh, I have to have an answer. You right. don't, you can actually right. go, wow, that's a great question. Not an area that's my expertise. And I don't want to send you down the wrong road. And the yep. audiences are like, wow, thanks. I didn't, I'm not used to that. Like I thought you'd make up something. I'm like, nope. We're going to be real here today. I'm here for you. So yeah. same with the show today, right? We're here for the listener, for the viewer. And so we want to be real. We want to be authentic in our conversations. So today with the Center for Center for Respect, are you working with speakers? Are you working with students? Are you working with general public? Like, tell me a little bit about what all of this that we've talked about now is kind of shaped into the Center for Respect. Yeah, so there's three distinct arms and you just named them. So the answer okay. to your question was yes, yes, and yes is the answer Perfect. to your question. So first of all, I, I speak all over the world. That's one massive arm of, the, of what we do in this organization, in the business, at the Center for Respect. So I'm speaking everything from middle school stuff to high schools, to parent groups after we speak in the middle school and the high school, mm -hmm. uh, to universities, a lot of welcome week. That's all I'm doing during August and September is welcome uh, weeks. Yeah. The US military all over the world. So I've been on four continents, been worked with every arm of the branch of the US military at every level from literally three star generals to newly just came through boot camp. So that's the speaking side of what we do. And then there's the coaching side. Right. And so the coaching side is what you asked, do I work with speakers? Yes. And I love that because what it allowed us to do is the person who goes, oh, I don't know how to present this or my topic's not the normal thing. Mm -hmm. What do you think I went through? Right? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have audiences that hate the fact they have to go in the room before they go in because oh. they're told they're going to a sexual assault prevention program. Ah. So they are convinced I am going to be boring. There will be stats. There will be PowerPoint and they want out before it starts. And so they probably I, feel like they're gonna be lectured at. Bingo. And right. they're gonna all be the enemy. They think yep. I'm gonna talk about them like they're the enemy. And it's yep. extreme opposite of that. So when you know how to deal with the toughest audiences, you don't fear any audience. Mm -hmm. So it, it really makes coaching a lot, a lot of fun in that world. And then the third part that we didn't bring up is corporate work. And that is really helping companies. And this is, this is the tagline that we teach. And that is build a mutually amazing relationships throughout the workforce. Mm -hmm. And it's a word that most companies have never even heard the phrase mutually amazing relationships. People are like, what is that even appropriate? <laughs> and so <laughs> that tells you how far we have to go that we're even yeah. asking that question of that phrase. I love, I absolutely love that. I want to get it right. Mutually amazing relationships. Yes. I love that so much as an individual myself, but also as you know, a leader myself, a boss, right? People who are only listening, I'm doing air quotes, boss. <laughs> and I say that because so many times in my career, when I've been in a position of authority, I've had to have the conversation with my team to, and still to this day with my team now with them, I have to explain to them, listen, this every, it takes so many of us to tango. I need you to just, if, if I'm the one dropping the ball, tell me I'm dropping the ball. If there's a task that needs to be done, task me. Just because I'm your boss doesn't mean you can't assign things to me or ha treat me mutually the way that I treat you. Cause we are all part of the puzzle here and we only work when we all work together. 
Um, and so mutually amazing relationships is not the, the standard practice. I have Correct. to like drill that into my team and they're like, oh, oh, really? And it's still, they still are like, oh, well, I didn't want to bug you. What? <laughs> like, come on, this is two way street here. I am just, sorry, I'm geeking out a little. Cause I, no, I love that, that you're geeking out because that's the whole point of it. It's not a power hierarchy system. Right. right? So hierarchy has its place in organization without a doubt. We need to know who's yeah. in authority. All of that is important. That's different than power though. Right. And most systems are built on power. I have power over you, or you believe I have power over you, so you fear. Great yeah. example. We talked about saying no. Most employees fear saying no to their superior. Yes. Which is a power game. Because if this was about mutuality and responsibility, you'd want me to say yes or no, because yeah. you want me to have a true voice in the situation. So mm -hmm. it, go, it shows up everywhere. And that's the sad part, but also the positives. We can teach how to, trans to really transform that into this mutually amazing, I'm free to say yes or no without guilt, without shame. I just have goosebumps because talk about how full circle we just came. Yeah. <laughs> we started the show off with your story with your sister and when power was taken away for her to have the ability to say yes or no. And now we're talking about being in the workforce and how no matter what, we didn't say men or women, That's we right. said power, authority, hierarchy and how that strips away our or adds in fear to say yes or no to a situation i mean i can totally see in like literally i'm just like look at mike this is where it all it all came full circle <laughs> in that that is beautiful and amazing and i i have so much respect for you mike well thank you stuff i appreciate look it's what fires me up people say how, you know, how can you speak about rape for 30 years, over 30 years? And I always say, it's because that's not my focus point. My right. focus point is building these mutual amazing relationships. If we do mm -hmm. that, rape goes away. Sexual assault goes away dramatically. Yeah. It doesn't mean we eliminate it, but it dramatically goes away on a conversation that nobody's even having. And so yeah. if we can start to have those conversations, and that's what I really love about it stuff is the second part, including with yourself. Mm -hmm. We have a mutually amazing relationship with ourselves. To, yeah. feed, to empower us to say yes or no, to empower us to go after our dreams and our goals. So when I'm speaker coaching, that's a big part of it. I got to help people build one with themselves. Yeah. And then teach them how to build one with their audience. Mm hmm. Oh, I, I'm, I could talk to you for a long time, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love what you're doing with the center. The center, it's a mouthful, I will be honest. The center yes. for respect. I, I absolutely, and you're right. I would have thought somebody else would have that as well. And that <laughs> does tell you how far we have to go on it. Um, I want to give the listeners a really good idea of, you know, I know you've shared the three different, you know, pillars of what the center for respect does, but who is it for? What is it that they're going to experience with you? And what's a really good way to start with the center for respect? Yeah, so there's, I'll go quickly to each possibility. If, if you're listening around going, I want my kids to learn this skill now. Mm -hmm. I don't want them waiting 20 years. I don't want to try to figure out how to have this conversation. And I want Mike in our school. I want that now. Uh, they would just go to centerforrespect.com, literally spelled out just like it sounds, centerforrespect.com, click on K-12, easy. If they're going, hey, I work in a company and we do training and we do programs and we need this, we want Mike in. Same exact website, centerforrespect.com. I'm just clicking the corporate, right? So super easy. The last part is somebody's going, I've always been interested in speaking. Hey, I'd love to get this approach to the, to the world of speaking and working with Mike as a coach. That's a different one because we try to keep that easy for everybody to go to. That's peakimpactspeaking.com. So I want to have you to give you the greatest impact with your audiences. So peakimpactspeaking.com. And I'm going to make sure in the show notes, guys, that you have both those links. So if, you know, whatever, it, wherever you lay, fell in those different parameters that Mike just outlined, definitely know in the show notes, you can click that to get there really quickly. And you had mentioned before we click record, you had mentioned that there is um, a really great, easy way to start with you. What, what would that, I think you have an yeah, offer. That's right. right now. So if, if they're looking at like coaching and they go to peakimpactspeaking.com, it'll give them a chance to do a free, what's called strategy session with me on speaking. Okay. So yeah, we provide that as a, as a really unique opportunity. So that's that. And if they go to Center for Respect and they just want to explore the possibility of whether the school will come, they can set up a time to talk with me. So if they, if they fill out our website form, we fill out, reach it back out to them and say, when can we talk? So nothing, you know, commits anybody to anything. We want them to be able to have an exploratory 
strategy discussion to really see what's possible. Yeah. So it sounds like no matter where you lay on that, if, if you guys, and I know you are, you're hearing some really good things from Mike, just have a call with him. It sounds yep. like that's the best way to get started. And you're very open to that. And I, I love how much in alignment that is with how you started with that uh-huh. mentor of yours, who was like, yeah, if you show up, I'll show you some things. And so I think listeners, you just need to show up with Mike. And I also wanted to say, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but I think I'm picking up things in between the lines. If you are a speaker and this topic matter isn't necessarily what you want to speak about, but there's something on your heart and you're not sure if it's going to fit or if someone's going to want to hear it, or, you know, if it's the thing you can talk about, I still know that Mike's shaking his head that still call. It doesn't have, you don't have to have the same Let let me stress something here, Steph. Almost none of my clients speak on my topic. Mm Mm-hmm. They're more of them are corporate association. They're not even in the K-12, which is where I got started. Uh, that it doesn't matter. What matters is learning how to take your passion yes. and turn it into something that can impact the world. You through mm-hmm. your voice. That's what it's about. And so it has nothing to do with topic specific. And that, so I'm glad you brought that up. It's about do you have that fire? Do you have that passion? Yeah. If you have a fire and you have a passion and you're, it's just burning in you and you don't know what to do with it. Give Mike a call. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. Well, I, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I appreciate what you're doing genuinely. I'm glad that you got to share it with my audience. Um, and I, I thank you just for everything. Well, thank you, Steph. Anybody who listens to your show knows your passion, your authenticity is off the charts. And that's greatly appreciated. So thanks for having me on. Yes, I appreciate it. All right, guys, we will talk to you next time. Steph here. Thank you so much for listening to the Passion on Purpose Leaders on Center Stage podcast. If you are a successful business owner and you lead your business with passion, we'd love to feature you on our show. We'd love to share with the world what makes your business great and how you have intentionally led passion throughout your business. Also, if you got any value or little tidbits from this episode, please take a minute to screenshot the episode and share it on your favorite social media platform. Be sure to tag us so we can properly thank you and we love deepening our connection with our listeners. We are regularly putting out new episodes to feature leaders such as yourself who lead with passion on purpose. So be sure to subscribe to our show so you don't miss any future episodes. For more episodes, guest information, or details on the show, please visit getvim.com forward slash passion on purpose. That's get V I I M dot com forward slash passion on purpose. Once again, I'm Steph. I am the owner and creative director at Vim. And thank you for listening to the show.